Hello and welcome to a special episode of Listen Up. I'm joined today by Dr Jacqueline Kerr. Hello Jacqueline. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> and this is the first in a series of community spotlight style interviews that we're going to be doing. Um, we're very lucky at Harkin to be supported by fans and advocates, industry peers, um, lots of people who are in their own way on the same mission that we are to create healthier workplace cultures for everybody. Um, and the idea for this came from uh, the realisation that everybody that's working in this kind of field of workplace culture brings with them their own experiences of the world of work, their own inspirations and perspectives. Um, and that's what unites us all in striving to create better futures. Um, so I'm going to be asking Jacqueline all about her life up to this date um, and how she's got to where she is today. I always feel very warm and fuzzy after speaking to you, even if we're talking about quite serious or sometimes a little bit depressing topics. So I hope that our listeners feel similarly inspired. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by asking what your sort of first ever job was, whether whatever you would consider to count as a job. <laughs> yeah, first ever job. Well, um, I was actually doing some summer work trying to sell double glazing, <laughs> if you can imagine that, on the phone, um, commission based, awful. Um, and then I had jobs in like a pub and actually like some of my more sort of fun jobs, like I was one of the first female bouncers at the University of Bristol. Um <laughs> So That's that was so a cool, cool. one. <laughs> but I also then, when I was living in the south of France for a while, I was also helping sell um, timeshare there. So I've had some of these really terrible sales jobs. And what that actually always helped me do is um, later in life, when I was a professor and running research studies, and I'd be training students to be able to reach out to participants in research studies around health and sort of say, are you interested in being part of our research? And they would get nervous and I'd go, listen, you're not selling them double glazing or, or timeshare. You're asking them to be part of really important life-changing research. So it's okay. You can make this ask. It's not a terrible ask to make. So yeah. that really helped me give them some perspective. <laughs> I love that. I love the first female bouncer. Um, I bet you've got some good stories on that. But perhaps another day. But you, am I right in thinking you did some volunteer work early on? Yeah. So I mean, I think there was a there's a, been a sort of through thread in in my life in some ways in terms of um, some of the volunteer jobs that I did from from being at school and sort of a a teenager um, was with older adults and that actually was something that I followed through later in life um, through age friendly cities work. So that was once I'd become a um, professor. But really, for me, I, I always had this feeling of um, wanting to change the world. And sort of my first formal job um, out of university was in advertising. And I really enjoyed this idea of being able to um, use communication to, to help persuade people to do things. But um, a lot of the products I was selling were things like pharmaceuticals and stuff that I, I didn't really believe in. But one of our clients was the, the local zoo, and that was all about their conservation program. So I sort of felt good about that and realized, OK, if I could use communication tools um, for social good, that would be something I'd like to do. So I ended up um, going and getting a master's in exercise and health science. Um, partly again, you know, our family has a, has a sort of unfortunate history of heart disease. My grandfather died quite young. So it was something that we had always talked about. So being healthy was something that, that I um, sort of cared about personally. And to be able to then go study it and have a career in helping others be healthy. And, and part of that was my thoughts were always like, you know, how do I prevent someone like my grandfather um, dying young? And so, um, yeah, that was part of my motivation. But I got really hooked by the research bug and carried on 
did a PhD and then carried on in a full um, research career here in the US. Corporate world. Um, but to go to go back a little bit, you really rose to the top of your game in the sort of public health um, sphere. You were cited in the top 1%, no, you were named in the top 1% of most influential scientific minds in the world, which is something that I would love to put on my CV. Not not sure I've quite got the qualifications for it, but I mean, top top 1% of anything would do really. But um, I mean, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit about, about life in the public health sphere and kind of not, not pros and cons is probably an oversimplification, but ups and downs maybe. Yeah, and I think um, in terms of, of public health, I think people um, saw in some ways like how complicated public health is through the, the pandemic. And I'm not saying that we as a, a public health community necessarily handled it the best way, because again, we, we didn't have a roadmap. Um, so I think that's so important. Unfortunately, here in the US, it became very politicized, but, but that can happen because public health is about populations of people and within populations is political polarization. So when we think about hesitancy to have vaccines, it's about trust and you have to recognize where people are at about that. You can't judge them for what they're saying about it. This is their belief. So there's a lot of belief that we have to get around in public health. And we really have to think about, you know, individual behaviors, um, people influencing each other, how our organizations influence how the, the community and society and policy. So it's very, it's very complex, but that's the part about it I love that it's complex because to me it means you have so many points where you could make a change, right? Yeah. Um, whereas if you really just sort of think about it as only individuals, then then it's only one person that can make a change. And lots of people talk about, you know, be the change you want to see. And I always say that, well, no, if it's only just you, yes, it does have some ripple and there's some part of that, but how about it's like we, the change we want to see, really bringing people together for change. Um, so that scale is so important in, in public health, but also that sustainability. Like, again, we don't try and ask people to be physically active if we don't provide them safe places to be active, right? So it's about the longevity of the environment that can support it. So, I mean, that's sort of the public health space that I find is so um, motivating and so impactful because it can be at scale and with real sustainability. Um, but the part that was challenging, really, is being a research professor. And, and I think lots of people think about professors just being sort of comfy and cozy in their ivory towers. Um, but as I say, I was very much out doing research in the field. I always went to my communities and embedded myself in, in their, their spaces. I didn't bring them back to the university um, but the different roles you have as a researcher, you're basically bringing in your own funding and funding your whole research team. So I had a team of about 40 staff and students. And so I would bring the money in to, to support them. And, and so that was part of my role. And then to sort of lead the research too. Um, you're also teaching. Um, you're also required to do community service. So um, serving on all the committees that I did was great because it really helped me understand um, how I could take what I was doing into policy levels. But it was also partly a requirement, right? So it's just more volunteer time um, mm -hmm. outside of your daily job. Um, and then you also had to take on leadership within the university. And so... I mean, the, these sort of all these different roles um, were challenging. They all had different parts to them. A lot of the the teaching role was also mentoring, not just mentoring students, but mentoring more junior faculty coming through. And that was definitely something I saw. I would often have um, female students and faculty come to me because they had been working with a male professor and they just weren't getting their needs met. So they'd come to me for advice. And I, I have said this, that I often felt like I let them down because basically I told them my mantra, which was work harder and you'll get there. <laughs> And I didn't really recognize the systemic barriers we are facing at the time. 
Um, and as I took on more responsibility within the university, I took on a position um, as head of um, population health and prevention in the cancer center. And each time I sort of moved up that ladder in the university, I just got more exposed to, to what I'd say was very toxic leadership. Um, so sometimes I would get a call on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m. being told that my work wasn't good enough. And it was just one of these things that I wasn't really very well prepared to to deal with that sort of um you know, criticism and aggression and, and interference into my family life. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it, for me, basically, I just sort of ended up taking on too much responsibility. And my kids were young. My son was being diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Um, I needed to get a different schooling system for him to support him. And, um, yeah, I experienced burnout. It was just yeah. um, too much. And I think that, you know, afterwards I learned a lot about the maternal wall and the motherhood penalty, yeah. and particularly in, you know, science and medicine where, where I sat. Um, and I realized that, you know, no wonder I was exhausted because, um, you know, you're expected to work like you have no kids and parent like you have no job. And and that is exhausting. Yeah. And there's a really particularly sort of bitter irony when you're working in these spheres of um, really trying to make the world a better place, like hyper aware of health concerns on different levels. And you can, it's so easy to go on for so long without realizing how much you yourself are struggling and how, how many injustices there are in your like everyday working life. Um, and yeah, I think but... what's so important about that too, Lydia, is when companies very much point that finger at individuals and say, you are burning out, go do self-care. And I always say this one, when you point the finger, you've got three fingers pointing back to you. So corporations have to think about that. <laughs> you know, so many people are doing self-care. So many people are trying really hard to stay healthy. And lots of people end up actually like having coaching, say within their company and getting better, getting back control of their life, making priorities, making healthy choices. And then they know that they've done everything they can do. And what they can so clearly see at that stage, and that happened to me too, is this is a problem with the organization. This is a system level problem with the organization. So when you point to the individual and blame them, the organization is taking no responsibility for their role in the stress. Um, and I think that's something that I've actually just recently tried to, you know, switch my head around because I do understand that companies do not want to take responsibility for stressing their employees <laughs> from, from so many perspectives that doesn't work for them. But blaming their employees for not coping well with stress doesn't work either. So I think there's definitely a space where we can say, how can companies support the success of their employees more? and really frame it and the same it's just the opposite side of a coin and what are the things you can do to have more successful employees and again that is things like coaching that is things like parental leave policies that is like pay equity transparency um yeah. there's so many things you can actually do because one of the things i learned through my burnout journey and, and learned about uh, you know started to really understand what is burnout, talk about it, um, realize I was not alone, because I think that's the other part where we said, you know, um, knowing that, that you're not alone and, and learning how to ask for help. Those were two important lessons for me. Um, but in that burnout journey, I really realized that the first step on the 12-point um, burnout um, scale, the first thing you actually do, those, those stages, is having to prove yourself. Now, that can come from your upbringing, um, that can come from your own ambition, but it can also come from the fact that women and people of color are refused promotions more often. So, you know, th there is an unfair system at play. They're getting less pay for the same work or less pay for more work that they're giving. Because again, they're often 10 out of 10 capable to do their job, whereas the men will get the job apply for it being six out of 10 capable. So the women are doing 
um, you know, just as well on their performance, but they're not getting the promotion. So, of course, you have to keep proving yourselves, right? And that yeah. means that you're on the path to burnout. So um, that's sad that it's inevitable, but that's also why it needs to come from our policies and practices within the workplace. Yeah. Yeah, and e even, uh, even beyond the kind of um, sort of unfair standing of women and other marginalised voices in the workplace, there's, I mean, just what you just mentioned really well was um, the kind of, the causes of burnout lie in the working environment itself and massive in Britain in the last month or so has been the University of Oxford's new study which I believe you've seen as well um, which really casts doubt on these kind of um, like wellness initiatives which and you know organizations are like desperately trying to improve things they're trying to make positive change they're trying they know that poor well-being is impacting the bottom line as well as their people um but that in particular i think we all sort of knew what it said to some extent but it was very kind of laid out really clearly that you know it's stress it's job insecurity it's juggling responsibilities and people can become as resilient as it gets but they like they're always going to be up against that same set of issues unless you really tackle them directly which is uh, very much one of Harkin's mantras. Um, but so you, for being a mum, being at the top of your public health career, um, was a very acute kind of set of burnout factors. Um, and I watched your TED talk the other day in preparation. Um, and the, one of my absolute favourite bits was uh, the baked Alaska an analogy. For being a working mum which in which she said we're trying to protect this ice cream in the middle whilst being blowtorched to perfection on the outside it's recipe for disaster and as a bit of a, a poetry and book lover myself i feel like that is a very beautiful way to describe something very unpleasant so hats off for that but um you at that time you were really throwing yourself into researching the challenges for working mums and what can be done to make life better for them so I mean in the UK we've just marked International Women's Day um do you, looking back if I don't know if you ever watched your TED talk back or lots of people I know can't do that but do you feel how you how you felt then in terms of that you know unsupported with the, those kind of responsibilities um how far do you feel we've come since then yeah and I think it's definitely been more of a discussion. So I, I think the plight of mothers came to the fore definitely during COVID. We couldn't hide anymore that we were mothers um, and mothers in particular were taking on so much more of the, the schoolwork, the household work. Um, unfortunately, many mums as well, because they were being paid less to begin with, were also the ones that had to give up their, their jobs. And we're seeing uh, that that um, improvement. Um, and again, hybrid work really supports mothers being able to um, do what they want to do in both places to, to sort of the level of, of um, you know, doing their best in both places. Um, so unfortunately, these mandates to go back to the office are really taking us backwards. And um, luckily, lots of people are um, then refusing to accept those mandates and, and they definitely disadvantage people who any sort of care caper, caregiver, anyone that's got an elderly parent that they're, they're working, um, that they're caring for. So this is, this is not just parents. Um, and again, it, it does mostly sort of fall to mothers, but, but fathers who do our primary caregivers, they're, they're actually more disadvantaged even than the mothers because the expectation mm -hmm. in the workplace for them is, well, you have someone else that can do that for you. Why is it yeah. you as the father doing that? So, I mean, it's it really is both. Um, and I love that part of my um, podcast, Overcoming Working Mum Burnout. In my, one of my last seasons, I actually interviewed dads and learned so much about the challenges they also face. So I think that's so important in this work to, to think about you know how anybody yeah. that's that has those sort of um, 
care constraints in some ways, right? When you're caring for people, um, you have some constraints. So I think our workplaces are still set up to say, you know, merit reviews are based on being able to give more time. Well, what if people do a really good job within the hours they've given that more isn't actually better? And I think from yeah. like our brain health, um, we know that. We know that um, doing more doesn't actually make you a better leader. It doesn't actually make your decisions better. And we get to the point, especially when we're in burnout, where our decisions are compromised, but because our brain is compromised, we, we're we not even aware that our decisions are compromised. And I think a big part. And pay transparency legislation came in this year, and that's been a really fascinating thing to see because I have heard from so many women who um, the pay that they, they, they've had, um, their pay has has now been like everybody in a group say there's there's a, there's a team and they've had their pay revealed and what it reveals each time is that the women in the team are being paid less than the men in the team yeah. and then they're having to have these conversations around okay what are we actually going to do to rectify this and um while sometimes the men in the teams are saying you know that's terrible i didn't know when you actually say well are you willing not to have a bonus this year so we can put that money towards bringing the women up to the same level of pay? They're sometimes saying, well, I've worked really hard this year. I deserve that yeah. bonus. So it's a complicated um, yeah, very. You know, topic, but um, I'm just glad that, you know, I can tell you women are pissed. They're so annoyed that they can now see that this is happening. So I think um, it was something that we always thought was there and I think it's now really clear on paper that yeah. it's there. Um, and again, sometimes that's been a female boss who has made those decisions around pay levels. So, so again, they, you know, this is these are decisions that are made across the board. It's it's not, um, yeah. you know, so so there's there's education on 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 both sides of gender to 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 make this more fair. But I'm glad we're having these conversations, and um, there's yeah. still a long way to go. But I think. Corporate America has a really fantastic opportunity at this moment in time to have a competitive advantage by really looking out for its employees and and looking out for the um, people on the planet. Yeah, that was really interesting. I think it's got to be a good thing that conversation is becoming so much more common about all of these things, whether it's gender inequality in the workplace, whether it's burnout. Like I've spoken to David lots of times about, you know, was well-being at work a thing back in the 90s? And he's like, yeah, we, he was like, now I recognise it retrospectively, like people not being okay in my teams, but just one wasn't talked about, but two was not really accepted. You know, you'd be, you would at least be pulled off the project, if not... Uh, quietly moved out I think which is just horrible to think because it's really not that long ago but I think mm -hmm. even though it's so frustrating that there's so many sort of systemic moves still to come it's reassuring that we can at least uh, see it for what it is and talk openly about it mm -hmm. um, but that was a really good overview of both your professional and personal kind of routes to getting to where you are today um, so let's talk about where you are today uh, which is Advising companies on behaviour change, positive culture change, so taking all of those sort of learnings, I guess, right through from your PhD to your public health career to your personal brush with burnout to you know, all of that. So do you want to talk a little bit about your work? Yes, thank you so much for that opportunity. And so I think there's there's sort of parts of my work where I'm still supporting leaders in public health research. And I really yeah. am glad for that opportunity um, because it's keeping me on the cutting edge of doing that. And when I support those leaders, often it's female leaders that are struggling in academia and I'm helping give them permission to give up some of these committees they're on to to prioritize their, their health um, and then helping them design research that is more impactful and more likely to get funded. So um, that's one of the things I do. And I think a part that's often missing, and I think this comes down to your work too, is um, we often try and talk about research and forget the story. So that's definitely one of the things that I really discovered in my advocacy work 
is that I could be there as an expert scientist in the room, but when the people that I trained as leaders actually presented their personal story with some you know, frameworks and data for me, they were much more convincing um, change makers. So I think that's so important is thinking about how do we empower um, our employees to to have a voice. And that's why, again, I, I'm, I'm so, um, you know, impressed by the work that Harkin's doing to do that. Um, so that's that's definitely um, one thing that 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 still continues from the research world I'm in, but also then in terms of corporate. So I think one of the things that's really missing um, from from corporate is an understanding of of how change in people at scale happens. I think we have understanding of um, change management when you're bringing in a new software system. Um, but again, the change is a, a short term change over sort of thing. It's not about how do you change long term culture and long term behaviors so that they're sustainable and scalable. So that's that's definitely a difference that I see there. Um, and then again, like you say, the Band-Aid approach that we have in corporate of here, take this app and it's going to help your health. And like you said, that research shows that, that the, the apps don't make a long term difference. And we knew that from our research as well. I've worked with um, meditation app um, and know that um, the, the impact when somebody uses it, it can be impactful for your health. It can reduce depression and anxiety. It can improve sleep. But most people do not engage with an app beyond three months. Because again, another piece that I learned from my research was if there is not human accountability behind a digital mm -hmm. solution, then people um, don't feel that they're cared for and they realize yeah. there's not a person who's going to hold them accountable. We need we need those two things. We need to know someone cares and that somebody's going to yeah. help us do better. Um, so I think that's why those those types of solutions are, are not working. Um, and so that's why we really do need this this organizational change. Um, but I think there's a few things that come on around that because I, I sometimes talk to vendors who are, are coaches or they're doing parental leave programs in organizations. And essentially they're finding that they their clients, the employees are getting better. And then they're saying, okay, we want something in the in the corporation to change. And when those vendors then are trying to speak to the CEO, who, who's one of their partners, right, in, in them delivering these solutions, there is still so much reluctance for actual organizational change. People will put a Band-Aid on and say, yeah, we'll support parental leave, we'll support coaching, but we're not actually changing the organization. So for me, where I'm at at that at the moment, because that's a big resistance, that is a very big resistance that is still happening in companies, is to then really draw on my other um, understanding of change, which is it comes also from the ground up. And that's so important. So I'm really trying to now translate some of my community leadership skills into corporate spaces. Um, so for example, communities of champions, like actually supporting a network of champions with, um, you know, so they can support each other, but mm -hmm. also with ways of learning. And this is another tool that comes from community leadership. It's called peer learning collaborations. And that's when actually people formally really study the change process that they're going through and they do small experiments and they have these learning cycles where they actually review, did that small experiment we did work? And then you sort of go, will it work over here in this other unit or is there something different there? So it's all about learning uh, in an agile way, being very flexible, adaptable, but actually being very purposeful in understanding why are you doing this? What do you think is gonna change and how does that work? And that's basically how systems change happens. It's when groups of pioneers come together, they form networks, they, they learn purposely from what they're doing, and then they share those lessons. And that's how an alternative system emerges. And, and it doesn't have to be from the top down, because again, the stabilizers at the top of the system see any change as risky. Um, they have some reason for doing, for feeling that way. 
Um, and they don't necessarily want to be the leaders of that change. But once they see change happening and it being evidence based and, and working, then they'll then they'll sort of jump on the new bandwagon. And and I think we just have to accept that that's OK. That is actually what our models show is how systems yeah. change happens. So so thinking about this bottom up and really thinking about what can we learn from community leadership that we can embed in our companies. Because another area where there's actually some great progress is in um, sustainability research. Mm -hmm. And there's, th there's lots of solutions there, but actually we're still butting up against the same problem is, will consumers accept new packaging? Will yeah. consumers, will, will companies be able to, soar, for example, reduce food waste when there's local policies against it. So if we start to really, you know, will farmers have sustainable farming? Um, there's peer learning collaborations amongst mm -hmm. farmers. They're learning from each other. And if companies support that and support that in their communities and support it in their workforce, then we can really sort of approach change and approach communication in a very different way way because we're not trying to sort of have this top down communication or you know sort of selling to to communities we're basically saying what are the strengths that they've got that can help us because again consumers as change makers they can be the one that influences policy too mm -hmm. they can provide really important mental health services for your corporation um so that's what i'd love to see is is much more um of this, um, you know, real integral way of thinking about change as a collective community effort and giving people really simple skills that that support that to happen. Yeah, I love that. I, several things I really eloquently express kind of the relevance of the community driven change to the work that we're doing. Um, and something you said about well being that, and it's the same with sorts of like AI well-being robots springing up in the UK and, and I think we always say people want to feel heard and valued and it, you can't mm. forget the relationship building piece in anything that you do with mm -hmm. your employees and you know, as you say individ individualistic treatments are worthwhile for individual lives but for lives at work like people can see through kind of anything that feels remotely transactional very quickly um mm. and employee voices is, is really important for the kind of relationship building piece i think um but also mm -hmm. really interesting what you said about um the power of kind of running small experiments and tracking your change because I mean, we obviously work with champions networks in each of our client organizations and that's something we're really starting to ramp up doing is like just small like case studies with people who are like find that kind of thing really interesting they're really good with data and then we're like oh hey, how were things at this point in time and then this point in time what's the kind of change curve we can see because obviously we use um the good day ratio gdr so you literally see a um it's really interesting doing that kind of work but it also it's motivating for them and it it positions them as pioneers within the organizations the people yeah. you kind of really champion hawk and get other people on board um so that's super important um yeah and i think it's so important the way you're describing it because you're you're gathering data um but you also have the voices to go with it and and that's what we have to understand is um and again back to the sort of digital health world and and all these innovators that talk about the data being important and the data and uh, ai is going to change everything well, actually, you know, we could look at a 50% and say the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. We can interpret data however we want. But when we hear a story, it elicits empathy, right? Yeah. So that's when we actually start to support change. So I think that's what's so important is that you've got this combination of data in terms of that, that GDR scale and then the voices and the stories to go with it. And it's those stories that, again, in a case study, um, really show like that it's so worth having this difference because it does give meaning. And I think, again, like you're saying, having these champion networks 
um, it's not only important to, to spread a message, to be the leaders in taking lessons and learning from them and actually promoting those and, 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 and making those really apparent. That's, that's such an important part. But again, workers are looking for meaning and purpose at work. And this provides that opportunity as well. So I think that's so important. And back to that Oxford study, the one, the one behavior that, that helped people more than all these apps and other mental health interventions was volunteering. So again, having some role where you are making a difference in someone else's life. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want companies just to be doing the checkbox of counting volunteer hours. But when volunteering is part of a team building effort and you're going out and together helping a community. Yeah. And again, respecting what that community has to offer in return. That's what's missing at the moment. We're doing a lot yeah, of charity yeah, yeah. work, a lot of volunteering. Very donations, kind of outbound, but not one direction. And yeah. Yeah. It can really come back to support us. So again, that's why I think like champion networks and organizations um, can really um, start to kickstart that work. So great. So we at Harkin, we talk a lot about the listening organization um, and how you know, we kind of see listening and redefining the way we listen is central to all of these kind of positive change goals. So we wanted to ask all of our kind of community members that we interview what what the listening organisation looks like in your sort of futuristic, idealistic mind's eye. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of comment back on, on a conversation that we actually had and our, our interpretation often is that people are bad listeners, right? When we think about um, there's all this data, there's employee engagement surveys or there's, there's employee voice that you have and it's like there it all is. It's all in front of you. And when we see no action, we assume that people aren't listening. Um, they've got bad intent. They're bad listeners. And actually, I think it's where we really need to understand um, the fear that people have around change. Um, so that to me is about us understanding partly who the listeners are and where they're coming from, because what they hear is going to be filtered through that outlook. Now you have some companies who really, um, you know, one, I would say assume, let's assume good intent, but you basically have some companies where they've been trying to make change and they're struggling to see it make a difference. They're st struggling to see progress. They've invested in a lot of ERGs, for example, but they're not seeing business outcomes from those ERGs. So again, it's partly that they haven't given the, the, the right skills and equipment, clear expectations. So, so again, it's, it's, it's really about um, giving people the tools and training so that they can lead change in that situation. But on the other end of the scale, you could have somebody who it's just not on their um, priority list to, um, you know, to, to that they're listening, they're hearing the issues, but they've got a whole different set of priorities. Um, and so also understanding that, because I think um, if we judge the listeners too much without understanding where they're coming from and how they're filtering it through their um priorities and um, then we're going to struggle so to me it's about finding alignment with those um priorities and and again also then starting to show the 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 perspective of the stories and things to make it persuasive along the way um, so to me a listening organization is one that listens and is able to take action as well because yeah. i think there's that such a big gap um, yeah. there. And again, Gallup shows it. 98% of employees say that companies will not take action on their listening. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that what I feel is we need that. Distrust and disengagement, which, you know, is yes. exactly what the survey is trying to tackle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. That was a brilliant, brilliant response. You've set the bar high for whoever, whoever <laughs> else comes on to answer that. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So Jacqueline's website is www.drjacquelinecare.com but I will put it in um, the caption or the bio of wherever this goes. Uh, obviously you can find Harkin on LinkedIn and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more conversations like this. But